If you've been in Newburgh for any amount of time, you're probably familiar with the Austin family. Ken and Joanne Austin founded the dental equipment company ADEC, which is now the largest employer in Hill County. They were also behind the Allison Inn and Spa, which was actually just ranked as the number one hotel in Oregon. Ken and Joanne were also well known for their major contributions to the Newburgh community through their foundation. Today, I'm interviewing Ken and Joanne's children, Ken Austin III and Lonnie Parrish, who have continued the parents' legacy of entrepreneurship and philanthropy. Ken and his wife Celia own Raindance Vineyards, as well as a successful llama farm. And Lonnie is the owner of Art Elements Gallery in downtown Newburgh. She has also been a major contributor in many efforts to improve downtown Newburgh, including the founding of the Shehalem Cultural Center. We talked about a lot of different topics in this episode, but still only scratched the surface of how the Austin and Parrish families are involved in Newburgh. In this episode, we'll be talking about the early days of the Austin family, how Ada got started, the next steps of the Springbrook Master Plan, which was one of the major dreams of Joanne Austin, as well as Ken Austin's book, American Dreamers, and the various ways the Austin and Parrish families continue to contribute to our community. Hi, I'm Daniel Roberts, host of the Giving Town Podcast, where we share stories of hope and generosity in Newburgh and the surrounding areas. We live in an amazing community full of incredible people who are all working to make Newburgh an even better place to live. This podcast is all about sharing those stories and helping people in our town be inspired, get involved, and have hope for our future. This podcast is also brought to you by my real estate team, the Joyful Roberts Group. And it's part of our mission to serve this community, not only by providing amazing service to our clients, but also to help Newark be an even better place to live. So if you're looking to buy or sell a home anywhere in or around Newark, reach out to us. We'll be happy to serve you. Well, thanks for tuning in. And I hope you enjoy this episode with Ken and Alani. Well, Ken and Lonnie, it's so great to have you here on the podcast today. I'm looking forward to talking to you guys about what you guys are doing in the community, what your parents have done in the community. I think it's going to be a great episode. We're looking forward to it, too. We are. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, you're very welcome. So, interestingly, the Austin name, and I guess the parish name as well, I think many people know the Austin name, maybe don't know how the, the parish and Austin name are related but it's one of the most well-known names in Newburgh, and your parents specifically did a lot for this community. And um, yeah, mm-hmm. a lot of people know what they did. A lot of people don't know. But for people who maybe are newer to the community or just haven't heard, can you share a little bit about your parents and how they impacted Newburgh? Sure. You want to go first? Sure. Um, a lot of it was related to how they could make Newburgh a better place to live. Uh, and a lot of it was foresight by my mother, uh, looking at, uh, she ended up buying a couple houses next to the Newburgh Public Library, and got the library to expand. Uh, working with uh, Joanne Austin School, she donated, or they donated the land for that if the city of Newburgh passed the school bond mm. to build it. Um, and then... Uh, they gave George Fox a bunch of land where their tennis courts now are. Um, and uh, they've also accumulated a large amount of land in the urban growth, or excuse me, in, in the city limits of Newburgh. And a lot, it wasn't really planned it, as much as it just happened. It started with dad growing up on a farm. He would, the neighbors, if you had your uh, mower on the back of the tractor, you just went down alongside the road, mowed it, whatever. And Dad did that for the neighbors. He'd uh, along Springbrook and then uh, Crestview, and he'd start mowing. And uh, a lot of times, many of the residents were el- elderly, and when they moved into uh, Frenchview, they'd offer them the ability to purchase their property. And so that's how a lot of the land got accumulated. It wasn't a planned event. It just occurred. My mom called herself a land lover. Hmm. And Ken and I have that too. But, you know, I think all of that became possible too because of this company that they started back in Colorado. And the only reason they started is my dad, dad couldn't keep a job. (laughs) Seriously, Mm -hmm. you know, and had two small children to support. And when he had this idea, 
And there's this famous quote how mom said that she'd support him, and, and even if we had to live on bread and beans. And so he came back to Newburgh, where both of their families were from. Um, my father's side has been here for generations. We actually live out on the, the family homestead, and then her parents came here in the 40s from Minnesota. But they came back home you know, really more selfishly because they needed help with the kids and family. Could and My mom came from a big family, so they helped work there. All my uncles and aunts, or like my aunt was the second employee and stuff like that. And then when it became successful, um, that's when they were able to make these financial contributions. But prior to that, as for example, the work that women were allowed to do in that era were like, cannery jobs and things. And, and my mom really wanted to have a place for women to work that they could be home in time for the kids to get home from school and they could, you know, take the kids to school and come work. So a lot of the job opportunities that ADAC had at that time were like assembly jobs and things. And she was specifically thinking about a safe, clean environment for women to work. Yeah. They um, really believe in taking care of their employees. And Ken will talk about the ADAC way later. But they provide um, good insurance and benefits and continuing educate all kinds of um, wonderful opportunities. So they just were doing that as they brought their business home and, and want to. Um, it's very important to our family and one of our core values is to give back to this community because without this community, they deck wouldn't exist. Yeah. And we all know that very well. And we uh, appreciate and admire everyone that's helped made it be what it is today. Well, and a lot of people may not even be aware that ADEC stands for Austin dental equipment company. So it's the largest employer, right? In yeah, no County and oh, in all of you. Mm -hmm. Now mm -hmm. it is. It's big it grew like again, so how did how did ADA get started? We'll get into a lot of the other things that your parents did, but how did that start? Um, I can't remember the number of jobs Dad had, but the last one, well, I'll go back. He worked for a company in Portland called Power Break, and they had a little dental division called Encore. And he was in charge of assembly and manufacturing of this dental division. And so what happened... Uh, he worked there for a couple of years, and uh, Dad's dream was to be an automotive engineer. Well, power brake was truck brake, so he was headed the right way, and they had this little dental division. He got shut, moved over to that, and he, he quit that job and found a job in Denver. And so uh, we've been in Denver for about a year and came back to Newburgh to see family and friends. And when we got back, Dad's desk was in a box. Oh. You know, you hear he got fired. Uh, we're in Denver, didn't know, you know, kind of what are we going to do? Um, and how old were you guys at this time? I was just born. You were. Oh, let's see. We moved back there 10, about 11. Yeah, no, I, was, about I 11. went to kindergarten, so I wasn't just born. Yeah. But it, about 11. And. So uh, we're back there, and I, I say we went fishing, and Dad had an idea, and he talked to Mom. You know, I got this idea, um, you know, and Mom said she'd support him uh, starting a company. And so he uh, sold the first product, exclusive with a company yeah, called— Yeah, tell him what we called it. Oh, so, it, the name they called it AVS, and we Lonnie and I called it Super Sliver Sucker. Yeah, it was, Super it, it, was it was yeah. the vacuum air vacuum system for the gunk uh, out while they're working. There wasn't okay. anything to pull that fluid, you know, that the air and water they're blowing in to clean it out, and he created that. The lava, okay, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, so and you helped him test it. Oh, yeah. I went down to the local gas station because that was the only place they had compressed air, and, you know, air hose. And back then they had uh, tanks to check for leaks in your tire. And so or inner tubes and we're playing around. He was sucking water out of the a tire tank. Mm -hmm. And so that's how ADEC got started. It was really a dream. 
um, not to grow. It was provide a, a reasonable uh, income for our family. Uh, and with Dad had a very unique ability to listen to people and take their ideas and be able to create product that satisfied a need. And then he was also a great salesman, but he wasn't a business person. That was mom. Mm -hmm. So they complimented each other. Mm -hmm. Very much. And um, the first employees didn't get paid for like two months until mom came out and did payroll. <laughs> I mean, it, yeah. it's the, the old history is quite a lot. Quite interesting. So this was started back in Colorado. Right? Mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. The designs were done back there. Uh, yeah. And production actually started here in Newburgh. Okay. Downtown on Blaine Street, uh, there was a little Quonset hut, and they used to joke, butt to butt in the hut. <laughs> there were two. One of them's still there. Yeah. On wow. Blaine. The yoga place was in it, and then I think it's been a flower of... Uh, yeah, wedding it's, still, show. it's still there. It's yeah. like downtown on Blaine. Yeah, yeah, it's right office. across the street from the post office. Mm -hmm. uh, wow. And the original one got purchased by the employees as a Christmas gift, and it's on the ADEC campus. Okay. The original Quonset hut. Oh, so they actually moved it over to the... Yeah. Oh, it, it, it. Well, it went up to... They sold it was a it barn to, for a while. It, it was a barn <laughs> and any long... Yeah, yeah. anyway, long story. <laughs> So what was that like for you guys? I mean, so you were young. Mm -hmm. right? So how, what's the age difference between you guys? Five. <laughs> uh, okay. Five years. Old. So you were about 11. <laughs> you were about six. Mm -hmm. What was it like? I mean, I, I guess at that point, you didn't have much of a comprehension. It's like, oh, dad's just doing his thing. Like, what was that like? Kind of being uprooted and say, okay, I guess dad's starting this company. We didn't, think, you know, we had gotten uprooted and moved to Colorado and sure. moving back home, um, different neighborhood, but uh, family was here. The move really didn't, I don't remember anything. The big, one of the big floods happened when we came back. That was interesting. But no, our family was here, so it was nice okay. to be back home. We have, what, 13 cousins? So we have a big okay. grown. That was great. It was weird that one of your questions asked about growing up in the business. It's, and that's something I've struggled with personally about, um, you know, you're a normal kid with just like your other friends. And then as the company became successful and you have people like by the time I was in high school, Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the students' parents worked for us. And if anything happened at work, you could, you know, and then they would call me names, yeah. and it it was hard. You got out of Newark before they. Got uh, yeah, successful. I was. Uh, you know, and then we four had years a... ahead of her, mm -hmm. um, and it was still kind of very unique. There, were, I don't think there was a hundred employees at the time, so it was quite small. But what I really, you asked that question, was the dinner table was kind of the main area of business being conducted. Mm. And one of the things um, I did, um, got asked by the school business at Oregon State to make a table for the dean's dean of business school new office. And so I made one. And to me, I called it the dinner table because most businesses in Oregon are small businesses, family run. Mm. And guess what? Dinner tables were ninety percent of the major businesses conducted. Mm -hmm. So, so as you as you got older, so what was the progression of? So you're in high school, you had gone to college. The company was kind of continuing to grow. So, what was that growth period like? Because at that point, you kind of recognize, okay, mom and dad have this successful business. They're kind of becoming, I guess, a wealthy family in town, and that you're a part of that. Mm -hmm. How did that, how did that, do you think, shape you like as you grew up with, with that? I mean, like you said, you are having to deal with people calling you names. And, mm -hmm. and I think there's obviously, you know, a lot of envy. Like you see, mm -hmm. you're seen as like, oh, they're the rich kids. Mm -hmm. But for you guys, you're just normal kids, normal mm -hmm. people. So what was that? It, for, uh, for me, it was, I didn't know the difference. And I still, 
really don't know. Okay, uh, jokingly, I say I have no money except what's in my pocket. It's and so I still carry cash. Mm-hmm. I use a credit card, but it's what I carry. My, if I want to get a, a say a hamburger or <clears throat> pop or something, I got to have the cash or I don't do it. Mm-hmm. So it's a very, still a very humble means. I think at least Lonnie and I both have very humble roots. It's okay, maybe instead of a beat up Ford pickup, I got a new one, but it's still very humble type thing. It's uh, uh, anyway. I think for me, um, <clears throat> My our parents, the expectations grew as the company grew, and um, well, we were raised with a lot of "this is yours, you will be responsible, you need to do this, you need to go to college, you need." And I was very rebellious. I think because I wanted my own, I could tell that this company could suck me in and have to become what they wanted me to be. And I'm sure that's why I am an artist, because that is something that my parents had no (laughs) part of. Okay. I can't buy it. I can't, you know, it's my talent, my creativity, my, my saving grace. It's what really helped me um, adjust to life. Yeah. And that's why I'm so passionate about art for the community. Um, Yeah, so I felt a lot of expectation, a lot of guilt and shame, a lot of I don't deserve. Um, I'm also very empathetic towards people, so I want to help a lot. My mom called me a softie, which is, I think, a very good thing. Um, And and that also comes from them, though. Because that's who they were. They always gave back. We come from two very giving families. When they were, <clears throat> my, my mom grew up really poor. And they would still give whatever they could to their neighbors. And my, my dad, too, that um, they lived on a very humble farm and stuff. So, but yeah, growing up in, in a small town with wealth is, is very challenging. So, you know, I just try to be the best person I can be and who I am and just, but it was a struggle. I got into um, alcohol at an early age. I thought, oh, and you, in the book, Dad talks about his alcoholism, but I thought that was a normal way to deal with stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, we'll get to the book in just a minute, too, because I do want to talk about that. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the other things is, I mean, your parents did a lot between the Alice and ADEC, Austin Industries, the Austin Family Foundation. Uh-huh. Can you share a little bit about how all those work together? How, like how the different pieces fit? Well, they're all at, well, ADEC, Allison, and the property are all part of the family uh, assets. Austin Industry. I'm going to say doesn't manage, but keeps track of all the entities and how they flow into the family. Um, and Austin Industries, if we want to do, say start a, I'm going to say woodworking, which I already do, but they will monitor, uh, help us with bookkeeping or whatever we need mm-hmm. to get started. So they support the family. Austin Industry supports the family in doing what they feel they need to do. Now, the foundation, it falls under Austin Industries and is managed out of the uh, Austin Industries. They call the Austin Industries what is typically called a holding company. Okay. And then if it was like a... You know, like a family tree, it'd be Austin Industries, Ada, the foundation, the property, the Alice, and any of the enterprises. And they oversee to make sure that we're following the legal stuff, work with attorneys, accountants, and things like that. But they don't run ADEC. ADEC is run by the management team and a board of directors. The foundation has its own board of directors. 
and that, the, each gotcha. of the entities. But Brian Naffin <clears throat> is the head of our um, family office, and he's just doing an incredible job managing all that. It's crazy all our, between all of us and all of our little enterprises, and I, I don't know how they keep it straight. And I don't know how people work for us either because we run in <laughs> like, what? <laughs> so they're great, and they're awesome people. So, But they're, I was going to say with that, they still have the same value set that our family has throughout all of the companies. And Kenny was going to refer to this about the ADEC way, which is something in the book that is a valuable tool that we use to kind of guide our lives in yeah. our companies. But I do want to get to that. I did have a question first with, with the way your parents, uh, I mean, like you mentioned at the beginning, like with the acquiring of land and always having the desire to give back to new work. Um, one of the things that I guess more recently and I guess recent history, whatever, however you want to call it, was the Springbrook Master Plan. Uh-huh. It was mostly your mom, right? Wasn't that mostly her? Well, well, yeah. It was her dream. Lonnie, I, my s- wife. Celia. Mm-hmm. Celia. And uh, Ashley helped a little bit. Grant helped a little bit. Helped draft that. It was, and when we did it, uh, we didn't have, there was need for housing, but it wasn't like it is today. Uh, we have since found that um, part of the the land is on an old ancient landslide, so you can't build on it without a lot of work. Oh, really? I didn't know that. And, but what it has done is we've got Hess Creek, which we're turning into a natural uh Preserve it, so we're going to have hiking trails through there, and it's really cleaning exciting. up, getting yeah. rid of the invasive species, and uh, mm. uh, like ivy. Uh, oh, what's the blackberry? Uh, oh, anyway, blackberries. Yeah, yeah, yeah the blackberries. blackberries. Yeah. yeah, that one's, and it had nothing to do with the faults. We found that out in a new recent <laughs> geological <laughs> survey. survey. So our nature preserve just got bigger, which yeah. is great. Yeah. I think that's great. So. Um, Polish Homes has purchased the west side from Hess Creek Corridor over to College Street, and mm-hmm. they'll be breaking ground and building houses this year. Really? That's okay. the hope. That's the Or at least. Yeah. 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 And then we have been working on that, um, the Hex, Hess Creek acreage. It's a nonprofit, and it will have, like Ken said, trails, but we've already been cleaning out the evasive species mm-hmm. for a couple of years now, I think. Uh, just about a little over a year. Mm-hmm. And um, they're going to build a bridge so the pedestrians can get off of that nasty dip. Okay. Yeah, so that should get started pretty soon, too. That's so we're very excited about that. That's going to be exciting because that was the final draft of that, was, or not final, but I guess maybe the first <clears throat> draft is a better way of saying it, it was back in 2008, right? It was a long time ago. So, which obviously wasn't a great time. For well, that's when they announced we were in a recession, just like. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, which so. is cool to build Allison during the recession. It was, there's really a great story, especially like with the art, because I helped to curated the art. Who can Celia so helped me a lot. But people weren't buying art. And, it, and we did. And we filled the rooms with all original art and the stories that the artists shared. And that, that was one of the most heartwarming things I've ever done was to be able to provide some stipend for some artists during that time it was cool. So the Allison really was kind of the first art of the Springbook Master Plan. Right? Mm-hmm. Right. Yes, absolutely. And um, it, which actually was interesting talking about the book, American Dreamers, which we'll get to. Um, so I want to make sure I'm pronouncing his name like Carrie Tim. Tim Chuck. I know, that's a so funny he one. Just, he just came and spoke at our Rotary Club, at the noon Rotary Club. So I was doing a little bit of research about about the book, and I was like, who's this Tim, Tim Chuck guy? And then he's there speaking, which I thought was so funny, but he made a joke that, I don't know if this is actually true, but that your dad said um, that he gave your mom an unlimited budget for the Allison and she exceeded it. <laughs> that was kind of a joke. I don't know. That I, was... Anyway, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure he told Carrie that. Yeah, Dad. Dad. He, didn't want, he and Scott didn't want anything to do with it. Well, they were busy with ADAC, right? And then mm-hmm. we were over spending a lot of money. But that's, a, I mean, that's an amazing end. Though. I mean, that is what. Thank you. 
Yeah, I mean, even just objectively, when you look at how it ranks in Oregon, I mean, that's really a huge yeah. offer for people. Well, here. they just got ranked number one in the state and Portland for the uh, in U.S. Forbes, news. I think, yeah. Oh, well, number one. Number one. Huh? Yeah, it's, um, she told me, but mom had an incredible foresight. She was such an amazing businesswoman. She's, you know, again, I want to just be normal, right? Don't want any fancy hotel with my mm. name on it, right? Because when we were talking about rates and I'm like, how do people, yeah, anyway. And she's like, Lonnie, this is going to impact the entire not only Newburgh, but the county and statewide. And I'm like, no, it's not. I don't know what you're talking about. Yep, maybe Newburgh, you know, but in, in what way would that be, you know? Um, and I'll be darned, it did, you know, because there was nowhere to stay for the wine tourism, really, just some bed and breakfast and, and things, and it really had a huge impact. Well, in the art yeah. as well, I mean, from my understanding, that was a huge catalyst for Newbert kind of becoming a local arts, and wasn't it? Or was that already kind of a burgeoning thing before the Allison? Oh, or yeah, no. Newbert's been a, a real a hub of artists for long before the okay. Allison came yeah. to support and um, accentuate and celebrate the art has been huge. But I think the cultural center is probably you know, the hub well, of that one. Yamhill County. Coalition. Coalition does an art tour in the fall. And that's been going on probably t t at least 10 years before the Allison even got. Uh, way, yeah, Ken and I were one of the first people. I have a poster with he and I showing art in it way back in the day. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, there, there's been amazing art here. But, but that, that's a feel good for you, though. I mean, like you said, you were an artist, and that was kind of one, one of your passions. But I do want to get into that and how kind of you start with that. Um, quickly jumping back to the, with the master plan. So, um, how do you pronounce it? Polish or Polish? Polish. 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 Okay. So they bought the West part. Is there, are there any current plans for over where, like the old school houses and over there? Very exciting. I, the, the, this is one where the guys and girls do not have the same, we're not on the same page, but I will say we want to develop it. We're dusting off the plans, and we're bringing our third generation. We call them the G3s. We're okay. generation two, mom and dad were number one, um, in to help reevaluate, and we'll be hiring someone to look at what makes sense. Now, I would hope, and this is what we argue about, saving that building. It's like, of course we're going to save the building. It's a historic site. It's not, I, that's what I do is remodel old historic mm -hmm. buildings, right? It's not a big deal. But, you know, to the guys, I'm like, oh, tear down, build a new one, right? Or take good measurements so it looks like people. No, are... anyway. But that, we'll, <laughs> we'll see what really happens with that. Yeah. But, you know, the, um, the steeple to the church is stashed away in one of our barns. Oh, wow. There used to be... Um, a chapel there and so the dream is to rebuild that in a small venue you could have weddings there yoga classes whatever you know and um red electric coffee shop and just some stuff simple ideas all the way up to having some retail and housing and yeah well because in a master plan that whole area was kind of like a like a plaza mm -hmm. like a place where people could come and I know my opinion doesn't count for much, but I'd love to see the old school house stay in your <laughs> model. So don't hate me, Ken. But I well, think if you go You're in. You're going to lose, bud. Yeah, 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 I, I know, are. but. We'll just vote. I, mean, I can tell you already the, on Facebook. The basement the or the lower floor is only about eight feet high. So, you know, you got to raise it up. And then you got to get an elevator so people, you know, handicap accessibility. It's big, two big issues, but. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll let you guys do the argument. That, but I think it is a special thing. Um, it is. It is. And I'm sure you can always pull the car what mom would want it. And... But yeah, we already know she <laughs> rebuilt it. I mean, we, we have the steeple in our thing. Yeah. You know, we took a lot of photographs of the area. Um, she was very involved in the arts and loved the arts and wanted to have a um, us to rebuild the old cannery there in, in a modern style mm. that we could have artists... Um, studios and have them sell their work like the Torpedo Factory mm. back in Virginia. That was her model that she had wanted to do. So 
We'll take a look at it. We might have a really cool art kind of museum thing coming too. So uh, yeah, we got fun stuff. So as far as the like the next phase of the plan, do you have any idea when that stuff might happen? I know planning can take a long time, especially. Yeah. You know that being in the real estate. We business. have no idea. We'll we'll proceed when I don't in our own manner, how we want uh, with the new generation coming on board and their input, uh, but also what the market or the city of Newburgh needs. Yeah. Uh, you know, things have changed. Uh, I would say three years at least for this, the planning part. You know, it just, just yeah. takes a long time. So yeah. hopefully something will, but there'll be plans out there. It'll take at least this year to get someone on board. A year of figuring it out, and then a year of design and stuff, yeah. Well, I was I have the utmost respect for people like you. You do development are involved, because I don't have the patience for it. For me, I'm like, okay, it should take you know, a few months, we can get all this done, and recognize, oh, no, there's, there's a process that takes time, and you have to have a meeting, and then reconvene, yeah. Well, when you work as a family, that means you've got to make sure five schedules fit, and mm-hmm. it's a lot easier just doing it on your own. But yes, yeah, that's that's exciting though. There's a lot. It's of really exciting. Uh-huh. Um, so back to the book though. We mentioned it kind of briefly. Uh-huh. Uh, American Dreamers. Um, can you give a, an overview of of that book? What led your was it mostly your dad or did your mom have any input? She you didn't know? want to be part of it. Oh, really? okay. She felt it was bragging, hmm. and um, so she would never interview Carrie. What? No, nah, yeah. she wouldn't. Dad wrote it. With Ter- or Terry wrote it with Dad's help. I don't, you know, however you want to call it. Um, and it, going through it, I've read it multiple times, and I think it's a good i it, it's a good way to get a feel what type of person he was. Some of the things. Now, being his son. I have a different perspective than what he said, but in general, I agree with what it said. Um, I think Lonnie will probably agree with me. There were th- certain things he'd do that just blew you away that he doesn't talk about. But mm-hmm. So for people who haven't read the book or for maybe just our readers, what's kind of the, I know you can't give a whole summary of the book in, in just a few sentences. I think probably how... Things, a bunch of things happened to Dad throughout his life. Boy Scouts, um, a professor down at Oregon State that took him under the wings in the school engineering. Otherwise, he would have never graduated. Mm-hmm. Um, rotary, he was a firm believer in Rotary. And uh, then what happened. Uh, they hired a general manager back before they wrote. He was working there before they wrote the Edac Way, and he didn't understand how they made decisions. He wanted a decision now. This will make us the most money, and they would say, "No, we don't do it that way. Why? We just don't do it." And um, you know, people ask, "Well, how do you make up your mind? How do you know?" And I think the ADEC way embodies their thought process, and it, it embodies, um, I mean, we grew up with it, so we, it's, unless something we look at it, it's second nature to us, but it was how they were brought up. Uh, both of their parents grew up in the Depression era. Grandma Austin uh, took she was a, his, a history buff and a gene, genealogist, and she did all of her notes on envelopes. She'd open up, and that was her paper. Um, never threw anything, very rarely threw anything away. But so, if you go through and read the ADEC way, or um, uh, American Dreamers, American Dreamers. Um, you'll understand that, you know, they weren't out to make money. They just wanted to make enough for a living. 
They treated the employees the way they wanted to be treated. So if you, you know, it's kind of like the Ten Commandments. It's if you, it, it's how you interpret it. But it's really how do I want to? If I want get up, go to work, I want to feel like I did a great job. They appreciate me, and I'm a valued employee. And what I say can make a difference to the overall effect of the company. And so for people who haven't ever heard this, is the first time hearing this term, the Adic way, what is the Adic way? Is it 16 principles? Yeah, they've added on to it, but they were like, to begin with, like 10 principles, you know, uh, care for people is number one. Um, yeah, it's, they're, they're really great. And then that was, they have people do this now, but back in the day, that was back like in the 70s. 70s no mm-hmm. one had a code of ethics or thing like that. That was something that um, they did because the general manager didn't understand their philosophy. Um, but I, so I reread the book again. Um, and it was, it was today for today. I'm sure every time I read it, it will be different because it's going back in my childhood. But, um, it was just a fun, light read, I thought. And yeah. it's a story about a young couple that had strife and, you know, hard time keeping a job with a dream and they made it happen. So it's kind of this love story, American dream that it really can happen. And along the way, it has tidbits for, you know, I think one of the, the things that, um, was really important that dad spoke of early was his ego. That's why he kept losing jobs. Cause he always thought he was better. His way was better, you know, da, 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 da. Um, and even when he talked about his alcoholism, how, you know, well, his form of alcoholism was special. It wasn't, you know, and the reality is we're all the same, right? It really, truly. And he gets to that point. Um, so that's something that is a really good, um, value in life is to keep an eye on your ego because it it, and it's it's sad because in the end what happened in his life was his ego came back when he lost mom he lost his guide he lost his his uh, anchor and his rudder and so he it was easy to have people build his ego and kind of get create anyway that's another piece of the story that um is a shame that had happened but it did Um, the other thing is just about working hard and giving back and and believing in yourself and your dream and going for it. And, you know, it's just, it's, I think it's a great story. And so it was fun to, fun to, and I think from someone that doesn't live it, like, oh yeah, that doesn't really want to happen, you know, um, that they did enjoy it. People like the book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, might inspire someone. Kind of one of the takeaways though also is, you take care of the employ your employees; they'll take care of you. It's it. Uh, it's true. It, it's very true, and so you have to keep that in mind. As I have both my parents working for me, kind of the opposite. <laughs> yeah, I was listening to your podcast today about working with your folks. It's it's yeah, family business is interesting. Yeah, it truly really is. I don't think there's ever such a thing as being your parents' boss, though. I'll make sure that doesn't happen. Yeah, no, it's not. Yeah, no, I don't think so. So, growing up with your parents, growing up with the ADEC way, how do you feel that shaped both of your entrepreneurial journeys? And you kind of then took that and and were involved in in some ways, but you kind of took your own paths in mm-hmm. yours too. Absolutely. Um, I was in college. Uh, and Dad had developed a lock for a pneumatic lock for prisons, and he said, "Here, the yours if you want to run with it." Worst mistake I could have done. Didn't know what I was doing, but on the other hand, uh, I learned a tremendous amount uh, by the school of hard knocks. But I also became quite a student designing pneumatic valves. How th- how to make parts to go round or on a lathe, and did that. Um, and I am still not. A, I say a nuts and or not nuts and bolts, but I look at the big picture, not the details. I can look at the details, but I'm not good at it. 
I, Dad and I'd sit in a room and we'd talk a design and we'd be t- saying one thing, talking about something three steps down the road and people couldn't understand where we were coming from. Um, so I, I learned to design. I learned uh, a lot of my strengths. Um, and when I I ended up selling the business, and started working at ADAC and realized very soon I didn't fit in the corporate world. Mm. I am kind of a lone, lone duck out, you know, it's kind of like, you, you, that's not the way I do it. Uh, very similar personality as dad. Uh, got into farming, got into woodworking, um, still into woodworking and still into farming. Different areas, but still in. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, my woodworking, um, I could call myself a wood butcher because I take beautiful chunks of wood and make them into beautiful pieces yeah. of furniture or something. But it's mm-hmm. um, so that's kind of how I got into the entrepreneurial side. And uh, would I do anything else? I, I couldn't sit behind a desk for eight hours a day or whatever. I did. I wore a tie every day, when, but uh, it's not my style. You're cut from the same cloth, it seems. <laughs> How about with you, Lonnie? Well, I, um, being the one bucking the system, <clears throat> uh, well, I grew up, I was in high school in the 70s, and all my friends were dropping out and getting their GEDs, you know, and I was like, yeah, that's what I want to do, you know. I don't see a lot of value in staying in high school. I was really into horses and um, and art. And my folks were like, that's just not an option. You are going. So I had one friend left, and she and I um, did greenhouse together, which was super fun and things like that. And we really in- enjoyed our last few years of high school. <clears throat> but um, And then I trained horses for... Um, work release that was my my world and did a lot of showing and stuff and so here comes the college expectation and i'm like well i'm not going to college right and they're like yes you are and you're gonna go to a sorority and you're gonna marry a businessman and you're gonna take care of a (laughs) duck like no that's not gonna work for me um i'm gonna be an artist so i bartered with them i you know it's like i'm not you know so i got him down to i could be an art major if i took business classes they gave up on the sorority i lived independently <laughs> uh, so i was i never did take a business class it was great um Anyway, I, it was really wonderful. I, the biggest thing, though, this was funny because so I got my way with being an art major. And then I said, and I really want to go to U of L because they have a bigger art department. <laughs> That's where they actually drew the line and say, absolutely not. You're going to be a beaver. Dad's the first Benny Beaver. We bleed orange, you know. So anyway, it's always a funny joke. It must have felt like treason to them. Oh, it had to have been. So anyway, I got my way and got to to do art, which I think, honestly, um, they my folks are really proud of me, and especially with my entrepreneurism. That's what they always told me. I mean, they created me. Like, you can do anything you want. I believed that, that I could, and I was capable. And I just, some... Which sounds egotistical, because I do have a lot of fears about things, but I don't hesitate with stuff like yeah, it, fixing it, that building. I don't think that's a big deal. You just get the right people, and you know you learn how to do it, and you can do it. So I'm really grateful to them for that, and um, and we've taught our kids that too that you can be and do whatever you want. My mantra is that that you work really hard. And you do your passion, and that you give back to the community, and that's those are my rules. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I can remember do whatever you want. You know, you they'd do, say that mm-hmm. they they'd say that, and uh, so I mean, I got to explore manufacturing. I still I used to uh, today with all the new electronics. I, I haven't a clue what's going on. Yeah. Uh, 
but still I understand the basics of manufacturing. I, so, I mean, I feel very comfortable. I can walk out and, or walk into any machine shop. Um, oh, it's the Tiger Manufacturing was in Austin Industries mm-hmm. last year. Yeah, that yeah, was awesome. And I'd walk in and look over and see what the, these kids are machining parts. And they probably look at me, what's this old fart doing in here? <laughs> You know, what's he know about what's going on? And uh, Anyway, so, uh, but when I started woodworking, I was surprised how much mm-hmm. dad acknowledged what I could do with a piece of wood. I was really amazed. Um, I think both of them were proud that Lonnie and I, Lonnie became an artist and did things in the art world. I went from trip, working with metal to working with wood. And uh, how we raised our kids, they were uh, excited uh, and really proud of her, their grandchildren. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Can you share also some of the projects and envisions that you guys have now? So you're, you know, you're, you got kind of, Grown up with a family, you kind of took your your paths, and now with the ways that you're giving back, you both have done quite a bit to help really continue your parents' vision of helping Newberg become. And, and I want to acknowledge as well. Um, I mean, Newberg, I think, is what it is. And honestly, like the reason I named this podcast "The Giving Town" is Newberg has a very generous heart, a generous nature, which I, I think your parents were really major catalysts for that. I think they set an amazing example. Um, both for you guys and the, for the community. So anyway, just want to acknowledge, I, I think it's just important to give honor or honors due. Uh, thank you. That's thank nice. you. How has that affected you guys and, and kind of some of the visions that you have now? Well, somewhere along the way, mom said, let's work with Oregon Community Foundation and set up a foundation. And I think I said, well, okay, there's six of us. We each put in one-sixth, and majority rules. And so that was really how the the next generation or the G2s got involved in get, really giving other small amounts. Um, with that, one of the things that foundation did, we really wanted to work with people and we donated money to organizations that just didn't do one time. They, they set up a program that would continue once funding stopped. It would, and to get back. Yeah, this, it, it, it was, was a lot of, you know, we'll give to you, but you've got to keep it going. Uh, Love Inc. was one of the best ones I think we ever, you yeah. know, they were just starting out. We helped them. Yeah, this help. is, no one really knows much about this part of, because it was through the Oregon Community Foundation. The name of it was the Trillium Fund. It was founded 24 years ago. Okay. Um, so we've been giving together as a family, the three families, for a long time. No, it's the three families, so you and Scott, you and Celia, and then... Mom and Dad. Mom and Dad. They got outvoted for the first time. That was a big deal. That's why it's called Trillium, because of the three families. Okay. Yeah. Like so it's not about the chilling flower, is it? Well, it kind of is because it has the three petals, right? Oh, okay. Yeah, three families. That was it. Like yeah, that. Celia yeah. actually came up with that. Yeah, yeah see, it was it, great. She doesn't talk a, a lot, but boy, when she does, it's really good stuff. So yeah, I remember outvoting mom for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> she was. They used you, to you that. can see Steve coming out of her. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, but that's a lot of it when um, questions about how we fund things with the large foundation, which was created after mom passed in 2015. Those are a lot of relationships that we've been having over the many years of giving because that's the invitation one. Okay. We have two. So how do the two foundations work together? Well, Trillium is still as a kind of a standalone yeah, it's still in existence if people are interested. It, it focuses on um, people doing volunteerism. Okay. So we did a lot like with Habitat for Humanity, mm. um, Serve Day at the college, and there were smaller grants. 
we didn't put the kind of money that's in this, the one, the Austin Family Foundation. Now, Austin Family Foundation has the main grant giving, the large one. Mm -hmm. And then they've got a small grant program where you can apply for max is 5000 or 10000 Yeah, it's 10 and it's really easy. I'd love to talk about that because sure, yeah. this one, we are really wanting to give money out quickly and effectively to the Newburgh and surrounding area is 20 mile radius of Newburgh. Okay. And, um, it's simple online process. We give up to $10,000 so monthly that's from the one that's it's, it's, it's still it? the Austin family foundation, but it's called the small grants fund. Okay. So if you were to go to Austin family foundation.com, someone else already had dot org football okay. player, not us. So it's austinfamilyfoundation.com, and then you'll see about grants. You click on small grants, mm -hmm. and then you just have to go to the upper left and create a profile. Super simple. Just you need your budget, your idea, how many people it serves, who they serve. Really easy where we meet once a month and give money out. Okay. And we need more people to ask. So, which is really interesting because... There's another part of the foundation, which is invitation only, right? Mm -hmm. And I think my impression was, I didn't realize there were two parts. Like, right. I wonder if many people had the idea, like, don't ask because then, you know, you're not supposed to with invitation only. So that's really good to know. Are there yeah. specific types of organizations or, or causes that you're looking to give to? Because well, I imagine you have a criteria. Well, you have to be a 501c3. You have to be a legal nonprofit organization. So that takes the individual off the table or somebody trying to send their kid to a special camp. Those sorts of things don't work, but we're very open to um, the different areas. We really focus on like health and human services, education, mm -hmm. early childhood education, STEM projects. We support there's very few things that we don't support. And it's usually it falls under, they're not a nonprofit okay. or they're, you know, it, yeah, no, it's very, very wide. Um, and that's the best way for us to get eyes on you for the big one. Okay. And we've come into more money. Um, my, our dad's estate closed. So we're giving more money away now, some really large grants at the uh, large grant level. And it's really important to find more entities. So our small grant um, is based on community health and education. Those are really big windows, yeah. right? Yeah, up to ten thousand, and sometimes we can go up to twenty. And then the large one, our focus, which is the invitation. But like, if we hear about this, really, like for example, we heard about the Carlton Observatory. Hmm. We're like, oh, that sounds really cool. You know, they should ask for a small grant. So we just wrote to them and said, hey, you want to come check us out, right? <laughs> And that might be something for us to look at because it falls into education and things. So the large one is uh, we have a focus on CTE and STEM, which okay. is very exciting. That arm is going to get going with the bond money that has gone through. And they're really doing some great stuff at the high school. Um, early childhood development and the mental behavior health. And most okay. of the money we've spent so far has been in the, the mental health we brought yeah. Um, we're able to bring in counselors for all of the schools. Wow. Um, it started with, well, the first thing we did was a study to find out what was going on in Yamhill County. So we have a really good uh, roadmap of what is needed. And that was also during the time that there were so many suicides going on. This is a horrible time. Um, we brought in, with the help of Working Community Foundation, all of the people and Yamel County that were doing work in mental health. That was the first time I had no idea that they'd all been in a room together and talked mm -hmm. about what each other does. So I've had people tell us like that was a catalyst for us to begin to work together, which was super cool Yeah, because the bridges they've built and that care that they do now is just phenomenal. Um, yeah. The majority of the money has gone for that. Um, homelessness, that kind of mental health sort of stuff, the crisis stuff that's going on. But we're looking forward to doing more STEAM and STEM. Yeah. Get 
opportunities for kids going. Yeah. Big grant. We did a big grant for Virginia Garcia. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of the uh, their McMinnville um, the workforce. I mean, I don't remember their the. Uh, it, it's house something house. Um, Oh, you talk house. about Juliet's house? Juliet's house. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. What are you talking about? The Rita's involved with the family place. Mm-hmm. Is that one? Yeah, that's one. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things we do get, you know, uh, with our involvement or involvement in the community, however, uh, family place, I found out, and I still call it the diaper place, but they were handing it. I, we came to Rotary talking about handing diapers out to people. So I immediately went back to the family and said, we need to look into these folks. Um, yeah, Ken's brought us a lot of people through Rotary. Mm-hmm. The zone, my zone, that my program. Zone, I, mean, I mean, there's they, so many things a, we support because we heard of it at Rotary. They didn't sure what my zone is. It's where we meet at Rotary, the, that church. They have an after-school program for middle schoolers. Mm-hmm. And they, the school district provides a bus to take them from whatever schools is involved, drop them off, and they give them... It's all kind of programming, yeah. They've got food available. They've got people, a couple people that might know how to play an instrument. Kids are playing Mm -hmm. instruments. Someone, a couple people help them on their homework. They can Mm -hmm. play games. They can shoot hoops. Um and my zone is really, I think, uh, hopefully a game changer for these middle schoolers that they've got something for high schoolers, they've got something for younger kids, but the middle school is just kind of left there. They go home to an empty house, maybe no, yeah. nothing to mm-hmm. eat. Yeah. Here's an opportunity. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. really great. And they've expanded that. That was one of the things that we asked. Just like, can you, ex- this program's awesome. Can you expand it? And they now do it at Edwards okay. after school, well, too. Or bring so. students from Edward. So, mm-hmm. yeah, it, it's really a neat program. Yeah, it's Northwest Christian Church does that all of that. Uh, I, I think you need to talk to Northwest Christian Church. They do a lot of. They, they, I, I don't know how they do. I, I was talking to the, one of the ministers there. I want to say Dave. But yeah, Dave Case. Dave Case. Yeah, I said, "What's going to happen when you retire? Who's going? You know, his go back. I'm not going to retire." <laughs> Uh, anyway, but yeah, they do great work. Because I, I'm a volunteer at Loving and do some of the intakes there, and they do. Like we see the different churches who can yeah. do the different contributions. And Northwest Christian is always doing. I mean, I, I don't know. They kind of blow all the maybe not well, all the, but almost all the other churches out of the water. It's I think they, they're it's yeah. a big example of what a church should be in my mind. And they have such a huge volunteer base. Mm-hmm. They, you had mentioned earlier about Newburgh being a giving town. I think they have been, you know, my folks fit into that. But, and I, my theory is it's because it, they had such a large amount of churches mm-hmm. and that our thought is just to give back and, you know, the Quaker roots of helping others. And I think, because Newburgh is a very giving town. It really is. Yeah. It's interesting. That's a good point too. I, I hadn't really considered with, the Quaker roots and all that. So maybe, I think I need to brush up on my own history too of, of this town and maybe that would be a part of uh, me. Maybe Carrie might want to come and yeah, Carrie's awesome. He's actually, actually really cool. George Edmund has a lot of good books about, he's done a lot of writing about uh, the community. George Penman. He wrote The Grubby End. It's the, he was the story the of two of Newbergs. There was the Quaker, Newburg, and then there was the pioneer grubby end of Newburg. Was he the one that started the, I, I think I met him actually, um, like, that actually sounds familiar. And I think he just recently moved, um, but didn't he start the Newburg Historical Society? I think so. I, yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. He seems like a yeah. great guy too. So mm-hmm. but he has books. I didn't realize that he had books on. Yeah. Uh, I think they're in a couple places that sell history of Newburgh type books. Mm-hmm. I, I, uh, chapters would probably have, okay. yeah. I would guess. Well, one of the other things I know that you guys had involvement with um, was the, and I didn't have this prepared, and I, I was just out thinking about it, the Hazelden Betty Ford Foundation. Mm-hmm. Carrie Bates, um, 
recently, it was not recently, a little while back, it was all a podcast. You mentioned your experience with that. And didn't your parents have a major part uh-huh. to do with getting that up? And so I think share a little bit about that. Um, dad was in recovery, went down, was a bitty for... He went to Orange County. Orange County for recovery. And his dad said his ego got in the way. But he was working with a, a physician in Portland. And the physician had dreams of starting a clinic. Um, and dad and mom said, okay, we can, we've got this property where uh, they start where, where it is now and helped them build it. And through it all, he was, he was a phys- physician, but not a businessman. So um, we ended up, t- or Austin Industries ended up, uh, the bank was foreclosing. They bought it from the bank, and uh, we provided uh, managerial support to get it up and running, and then we sold it to Betty Ford. Mm. Yeah, it's... Um... Yeah, it was super cool because when dad had felt that this was what meant his ego, like, well, his alcoholism, he was a professional with this fancy company, you know, he just didn't have all that in common with the other, you know, local people, which is what he, he refers back to. It's just, that's just not true. Alcoholics are alcoholics. It doesn't matter where you come from, but he, he really felt there was, and I believe that there's a, there is a need for say like a doctor or dentist because you know people rely on those for their health and well being if they know they have a drug problem or alcohol mm-hmm. problem and stuff. So Hazelton was built. We'll call it Hazel, Springbrook Northwest was its original name. Okay. Was built for the professional, and it has kind of a nickname of the country clubs of recovery, which is something they're trying to remove and and by bringing in opening it to everybody now, which is really good. Mm-hmm. Um, Hazleton's an incredible organization to be part of. And the kind of um, the publishing company they have, like when I got sober, some of my and still are my favorite books are through the Hazleton Publishing. Mm-hmm. And we um, gave them a grant along with the school district. They're doing a program there. Um, to help kids just learn how to deal with like organizing your time and how to deal with bullies. And um, I guess they love it. The school came back to us and said, and it wasn't Hazleton asking for money this time. It was the school saying, we love this program. This is something we want to keep doing. So yeah. anyway, yeah, it's really cool. I heard rumors at one point there's like across from the Allison, like on Mountain View, um, like where the orchard was, that was taken down. Uh-huh. There was going to be a new building there. I don't know if that was just rumor, if that was actually part of the the plan. Rumor, <laughs> rumor, rumor. <laughs> yeah, there's no building there's no, going there. Go around a lot. Yeah. Um, okay, want to make sure don't tell people like yeah, I think there's something going in there. Um, um, no, that's planned. The master plan has that as housing. Okay, that's what I was thinking. Mm-hmm. So yeah, no, no, there's just not a there's not an expansion. The Hazelton has their own land. They have another block like. Big chunk of land if they wanted to grow. Okay. Yeah. The, so the the hazelnut orchards were they just taken down because they were in the, they had blight or? the disease. Okay. Uh, a lot of the old hazelnut orchards have blight, and they look terrible. And basically, the only way to take care of them is remove them and, mm. and burn it. And stuff. Burn it because the amount of chemicals you get us spread on them to keep them kind of going producing but eventually they'll die okay well that's a bar yeah, yeah. <laughs> but they can do, those Oregon states blight. developed a blight resistant mm-hmm. variety of hazelnut mm-hmm. so all the new orchards that are probably last 15 years are being planted with the new variety okay you're a little guy no one ones. of the things we hadn't mentioned yet Lonnie it was with art elements that was one of the major things that you were involved with and I mean still are so what, yeah. how did that get started what, what's the story with you probably don't even know about my whole little empire no I don't yeah know. that's, no, that's yeah that's what these, my <laughs> empire <laughs> my land lovers <laughs> so um 
I spent a lot of time uh, volunteering in the schools. I taught art and did all this work and doing um, art literacy programs and stuff. And then, in fact, I taught in St. Paul um, High School Art. So when my kids graduated, and one of them jokingly said, you know, you need to get a life bomb. It's it's not us anymore. And I was just like, ouch. <laughs> but they were so right. And uh, I started, it was a really great time in the market. And I've always loved old buildings. Mom and dad and I would run by the Dairy Queen, grab an ice cream cone, drive around and go, oh, look at that old the house. Isn't that cool? Look at that building. Remember when it was flatters, you know, blah, da, 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 da. Um, anyway, I really wanted a downtown building just to fix up. I don't know why I wanted, I think I used to hang out with dad in the garage and want to build stuff too. Right. Um, so I thought, what a cool thing to do for my kids is to have these two girls become independent, strong women. I should get a house and have them like flip it. That would be a good thing. So I wanted to do that, but the market was so hot. Nobody in Newburgh would return my phone call for this little cottage kind of thing I'm looking for downtown. And so I finally went online and I saw the Kelly Group's website and I thought, okay, there's a way I can contact someone. And, and I wrote and they answered back. That's how I met Rita Wolf. Okay. Yeah. My best friend. And, um, I started looking at places and I bought, what I went to look at, it was really weird, is where I grew up as a kid. And I said, no, that's not it. And she was like, well, what do you want? And I said, I want a little cute fixture up her cottage, downtown neighborhood. I mean, she called me in two days. And I got this pocket listing. It's really cute. Oh, it's cute. So I bought it, and the girls did all the work on it. And then during that time, it's the same story as mom when they were helping the farmers with their land. They would say, Joanne, do you want to buy my farm? I know you'll take everything. People are like, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, girls are blah, blah, blah. And they're like, well, I'm selling my house. I would love to have you have it. Mm -hmm. So I started buying these houses and all of a sudden now I'm, and I get like better ones and cooler ones and they're all old and they're all around the cultural center mm -hmm. area. Um, and then I, I bought the build the art elements building, knowing I'd make a gallery out of it. And, but I had 13 properties in town. Okay. Like over four years, I think I bought them. Um, and I just have a couple left to develop, um, which is exciting. Um, I had kind of put it on hold when when mom passed. It was taking care of dad and focusing on that. And then when dad passed, we had the lawsuits, the all that turmoil. And then now um, Kenny and I our positions on the board and all these responsibilities and, you know, I'm the chair of the foundation and all these things have been really busy. And I've noticed this last year, I've been able to free up my dreaming machine again. Yeah. And, um, the mill building, I have that, the one on Maine, the old mill has read his picture oh, yeah. on it. Yeah. Yeah. So I've always wanted to do like a maker space art, something art related, you know, um, I, Anam Kara is now open and my friend who is, she's back from Texas. She went to, she helped me open the gallery and my Lionsgate bed and breakfast that I had. And she's like, well, Lonnie, instead of doing the giant one, why don't you start small, try it at Anam Kara. So I am looking at starting this makerspace makers on Maine. got a, not a name for it already. Mm -hmm. working on the idea of the logo, but I've had the opportunity after <clears throat> helping found, <clears throat> excuse me, the cultural center, all these people that I know that could help make this thing work. It could have to be a nonprofit and stuff, but I'm going to start small and then maybe grow it across the street and do that whole big art scene down on well, main street. That's exciting. Mm -hmm. It's very exciting. Yeah, I wondered actually that now that I mentioned that building, I always wondered like, what is that building? What is it going to be? So there's eventually plans for that. So you're starting with, wait, where's that? Uh, car? It's right across from uh, Nara Teriyaki. Okay. And then right across kind the of other way is, is the uh, mill old, building. Yeah. Anvil Academy is in there. Yeah. So I've given them, well, basically give them the building and they're looking at maybe getting the sawdusters in. Those are the. Be quiet on that one. 
Oh, I already okay. they know. Oh. I've <laughs> okay. <in> my space. <laughs> so anyway, so then, yeah, and I've got these great people that <clears throat> helped with the building of the cultural center that I think can help make this happen. Yeah. Very excited about that. And I've been trying to sell buildings, but I just hit the market a little too late. Like the recipe, I really wanted mm-hmm. to sell that. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's rented, so that's good. Okay. I didn't realize that was your building. Then Pulp and Circumstance. Okay. And I've got some really amazing buildings. That's but fun. it's just quiet. I don't... Yeah. Yeah. But when I first bought them, it was like, what's she doing, you know? Uh, <laughs> yeah. She's running the town. I'm like, no, not. I just... I look at them like children, right? And then I fix them up and modernize them. And then I'd have these amazing tenants. And they just so cherish them. And like Pulp and Circumstance, they've been there 14 years. Autumn Care was there 14 years. Hmm. It's really great. Well, but, I got one more question for each of you. It's kind of, I'll kind of break it into two, actually. So one is, um, given your position in the community and with your parents, I mean, I think a lot of people in many ways look up to you, look up to your parents and, and see that as role models, which that's really the heart of this podcast is to highlight people who've, who've done a lot. And it's not, I mean, you mentioned the, the word ego a lot of times. It's not about ego, but it's about how can we, you know, there's a sense of responsibility. Like how can we set a tone for, for what this community is? And, you know, especially on social media, there's a lot of tendency for people to, to do a lot of backbiting and talking and complaining. Mm-hmm. And of course. This doesn't accomplish anything. And that was one of the major reasons I wanted to get the word out about this podcast and spread, hey, how can we have messages of hope, of positivity, and say, hey, let's focus on the good. Let's focus on the things we can control, take care of our neighbor, love each other. And uh, I think you guys have really exemplified that really well. So, so with that, what message would each of you like to give to the community? And then alongside of that, what gives you hope for the future of New Birth? Why I thinking about it, um, I I tr- we try not to draw say we're for this for that other than on a personal level. And I think what happened, I'm going to say this, what happened with the school board and everything, I see it very bad and I see it very good. It got the community energized about the school system, what they're teaching, how the, everything went about. I feel very sad about how, you know, depending on which group you're in. Um and, you know, we worked with both sides of that, one in the school system of STEM with other people trying to help the needs, the mental needs of the community, especially teenagers and that sort of thing. So I think you have to, what I would say is set aside your political beliefs, look out for your neighbor. I just bottom line, look out for your neighbor, help them. Um, you know, when dad grew up, he lived on a dairy and he said, uh, if the neighbor didn't have money to buy milk, they would take a gallon of milk or whatever because they had plenty. And I think we have to kind of approach it that way. Help your neighbor. It's not based on anything else. It's just help each other out. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we're we're not in this alone and we can't be, we're not going to make it if we're all like siloed. I'm out for myself. It's, um, we truly need to help each other and, and be kind and listen and try to find. And I, I hope, and I think that I feel like that's what at least my, I feel like my role tries to be. I just, don't get involved in political stuff. I just, I would rather be a bridge on how do we find commonalities? How can we solve the problem? Mom was so good. She would have been really great doing, she worked both sides of the party. Like, let's find a solution. You know, this is your belief and this is your, but like, let's, let's work it out. Let's, you know, um, everyone's so polarized now. That just broke my heart to see how that went down. And, 
I think the community learned a lot about maybe what we don't want to do <clears throat> and approach things. So I just, you know, be kind, listen, try to find a solution, you know. And I, and you make a really good point, actually, about the, I mean, the listening part. And I notice myself, even sometimes it's easy to jump to conclusions. You hear something, a rumor, and then you begin just believing that as truth and it hasn't been confirmed. And, um, I mean, just, just as an example, I mean, it's very obvious. Everyone knows, you know, Dave Rao is one of the big, like, public enemy number ones. And I remember feeling like I started believing some of the things. I actually sat down and we had coffee together and realized, and sure, we not see I don't, I don't, everything, but I realized, like, his heart in many ways is actually really good. He's actually a really kind person and maybe the way some of the things happen. Sure. I can understand why this people disagree with. Um, but just like the act of like, if there's something you disagree with, like find a way to get together, have coffee, have a conversation mm -hmm. rather than arguing over, over Facebook on, on stuff. I, yeah, I, yeah. Social media is it's not, it's not talk, talk about blight. That's, that's yeah. Really, there's yeah. your, there's your blight right there. <laughs> Well, you know, that's, I remember having debates with people and it was healthy, you know, you believe one way, I believe another. And we talk about it, I'll learn something new and you'll learn something new. And there we go. We're still friends. And that seems to be gone. Yeah. And I don't, I don't, you know, there's not tolerance for things. I don't know. I think that you said, I think we have learned a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me personally, that's what gives me hope as I've seen we've come together, but and I guess that's the second part of the question is what for each of you, what can you hope for, for the future? I guess both for the, the Austin parish family and, and for me, Well, family work together because you've got, well, there's seven, uh, seven family families right now. And, um, that includes spouses. Count, well, anyway, there's seven different, vo well, 14 different voices at the table when we sit down and uh, meet. Um, and overall, we work pretty well together. There's a few things we disagree on, and, but at the end of the day, I think we go home and we may not agree with you, but we respect the decision that was made. Um, and uh, sitting here in Newburgh, uh, or living here uh, in, te in, in this community, I see it has so much potential if people start dreaming. Mm. Um, you've got an opportunity to build a unbelievable community. Now, maybe you're not, and I'm going to say wine, but you could actually say farm products. You've got across the river, you've got this huge agri, well, up to the river, but St. Paul area. I mean, that's a huge agricultural area. You've got the wineries, you've got, uh, so many things, and we're so close. We're, I'm going to say, an hour from, used to say an hour from here to the beach, and an hour and a half to ski. It's about two hours, both, or an hour and a half. Again, you know, I had a half hour. But, I mean, we're located in such a beautiful area. Um, when the sun's out, this area is just gorgeous. And uh, I think we need to per keep that feeling of, um, ruralness, embrace the modern era, but remember where our roots came from. I think th that is probably going to be uh, what's going to help us long term. Uh, uh, we've got, I don't know how many churches, churches are in the community. Um, you know, if they talk to each other, work together, I think we can do great things. Even if you're not uh, a religious person, you'll get involved. Join a service club. Do things mm -hmm. kind of... Uh, I think one of the best things I ever did was join Rotary. Now, Dad was in Rotary, so it was kind of natural. I'd follow him. 
Um, but one of the things Dad did is put together a donation where ADEC donates 100 dental units a year to the Rotary Clubs of Newburgh. And with that, um, the Noon Club has set up huge scholarship funds. Um, the Early Bird, which I'm a member, we now have over a million dollars in our endowment. So every year we are able to give back to the community through the Rotary Club, through different things. So, and we're very, Rotary, I mean, if you get involved with Rotary and do the four-way test, so many things. Look at the uh, Boy Scout uh, law. So that Your motto. Motto. <clears throat> you know, you, you go through some of the things that have been around for year, very long time, and live by those. I think we'd be a great community. I think. Um, I think there's some great opportunities. Mm. How about you, Lon? Well, I actually have a lot of hope with the young people. And I am just so impressed with um, George Fox and the graduates and students that are there. Um, I've had the opportunity to have some employees that came from George Fox, but they're who they are as people, I, I love that. And if more people were like that, and I know a lot tend to stay, it's, you moved here from the school, right? Your experience at, from George Fox, yeah. right? You know, and I there's a lot of people in it. That gives me great hope because the morality and basis for how you believe is like the heart of giving. I mean, look what you're doing. It's Daniel, it's really cool. I love Thank your you. podcast and you're celebrating kindness and the positivity and it's those sorts of things. And that gives me great hope. And I think that people sat silent during the fight because they were afraid to get in the fray of it. And I think today people are more willing to just do what they believe and to give back and to be kind and to listen and find common ground. Um, and I, I think Newburgh's ripe for that. And I have a couple, we're, I'm riding horses again, my granddaughters, I'm back in the horse world. And I've got a couple of teenagers part of my life now. They're amazing. They're good kids. I think our future's bright. But it all just goes back, you know, help them navigate the social media stuff and, you know, and just be kind. And just those things we have to drive home. And I think a small community like this, we still watch out for each other. You know, and, and it's small enough we go to the grocery store and see people we know and the truckers know us. And we just had a family retreat here and brought some of our counselors in from out of state. And we were at Rose Marino's for dinner. And, you know, they're like watching us talk to people. And they're like, this is a small town. And it's like, yeah, it's cool. It's a small town. We take care of each other. And I like that. It gives me yeah. hope. Well, thank you both for, uh, one, for all you do. Thank you for coming on today and sharing a bit about your parents and, and what you guys are doing. And, um, yeah, it's just, it's great to have you a part of the community. We, we, I appreciate you. I know a lot of people appreciate you. I think the, a lot of people don't express this. I found that a lot of people who do great things, everyone always assumes that everyone's always telling them how, you know, grateful they are for that. So I hear a lot of people saying, their gratitude for you. I don't know how much you hear it, but I do know that you're very appreciated. Um, and I think it also just says a lot for your parents because there is a stat I'm sure you guys are familiar with, with 90% of families who have a lot of wealth or a, or a big business, 90% of families to the third generation don't make it. Yeah. And so the fact that you guys have your family is still strong and intact really says a lot for the foundation that you guys have. And um, I think that gives me great Oh, for, I think you said a great example of, hey, here's how to do this. Here's how to do family well, too. I'm sure there's hard conversations and all that, but staying together is is, is amazing. So um, so thank you both. Thank you. And thank I you. Know we are, uh, this is probably one of the longer podcasts I've done, but I appreciate it. It's great to hear the story. Yeah. Thank you both for taking the time. Thank yep. you. Thank you.
Thank you for tuning in to the Giving Town podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider sharing it with a friend who you think might benefit from hearing it. While more and more people are continuing to hear about this podcast, I still need your help to spread the message about all the people and organizations that make Newberg so great. Well, thanks for tuning in and I'll catch you in the next episode.